what we like to do to wrap up a session of Saturday University is to have, um, have a roundtable discussion that involves all of our panelists. That said, are there questions or comments? I don't have a question as much as I have a comment. Because I have a lot of friends that are very radical about everything in their life that suits them. And I feel our planet will only survive as long as we keep ourselves informed, educated, and everything in moderation. It doesn't have to be black and white. It can be shades of gray. Any responses? Yeah, I, one of the things that I'm really passionate about as an educator is having our, our students and the public understand to the extent possible the differences between the things that we know to be true, the facts, the black and white stuff, the things that we think are true. I mean, a lot of what we study is falls in this realm of, of theory that can be um, hard to intuit or because it's all based on reasoning, um, you can never prove. I mean, for instance, um, things about um, global warming, I mean, we, you know, we do science, we say we do science by replicates and by using controls and we only got one Earth and we're in the middle of the experiment and there's no replicates and there's no control. Um, so anyway, there's this whole realm of information that is logically based but is not provable that we call theory and then there's this part where our values come in that I call opinion and when I'm, when I'm working with students in the classroom, I, I'll make a statement and I'll try and get them to say, now was that a fact, was that an opinion? Or was that a theory? And why do you think so? And how does that work? And I think the, the more kinds of critical thinking we can inspire in mm -hmm. students and the public, the better decisions will be made related to our future. Indy, are you implicitly skeptical of opinion? Or do you find that, that, that opinion is where we go wrong? Or what, what constructive role does opinion play? Understanding your value sets and your own values and the values of other is, are, is the only way you can find common ground to have a, a conversation about decisions or policies that need to be made. And in fact, far more decisions are made on value systems than are on the science. Uh, but everybody's got to have this common ground. You know, what are the facts? What are the theories? What are the competing theories? And then why are there different value sets engaged here? Because um, all issues that face humanity embrace all three of those realms. And just knowing the difference, because we ought to be able to agree about the facts, and we ought to be able to at least have a completely dispassionate discussion about theories. I'm thinking in relationship, um, Jake and Indy, to your talks, both of you were talking um, about science, pure science, theoretical aspects of your scientific research, but maybe another form of charismatic uh, fauna that you have to deal with is, is the politician and the political world. And I think both of you, probably for really good reasons, shy, shied away from that. But how in each of your work do you see um, politics playing a role and how, um, how best do you as, in the scientific community try to, try to negotiate between the scientific world and the political world, which brings other kind of values and considerations to bear. Uh, most of us trained scientists are trained to pay no attention to politics. To, to answer questions inspired by curiosity or how important we think the question is for the future of humanity. So we're, you know, um, we're, we're inspired to ask logical objective questions, which probably doesn't mean that we're not influenced to some extent by our own, own value systems in, in asking those questions. Uh, in, in my role at the University of Wyoming, uh, I had never encountered politics before I became director of the Haub School of Environment and Natural Resources and um, spent about two years completely befuddled by trying to figure out why politics should have anything at all to do with science. I mean, this is just, this is, I just represent a naive scientist. Am I doing okay, guys? I mean, this is us, right? We just do science, right? Uh, and then people called who were mad about results of science and things that are coming out. So um, I, I think the role of a university in society is to do unbiased work and provide it uh, f f to advance knowledge. Uh, for our collective futures and that to the extent possible 
universities uh, and the work that we do should not be inspired by politics and certainly shouldn't be threatened in any way by politics. That said, I now wear an administrative hat. And there are times when uh, diplomacy or talking about things in a different way, using language that doesn't um, inspire negative responses, is really, really important um, to be able to support our faculty. Uh, hello. Um, I uh, noticed something in um, uh, uh, Jake's talk about elephants and lions that I thought was interesting in that the ant colonies in the uh, trees protected the trees from the elephants and I thought you know that's a an instance of an insect population that's kind of symbiotic with the the tree and um, um, a question came to my mind what about entomologists and how are they um, I guess uh, hooked in with um, ecosystem preservation and maintenance and the bigger question that comes to my mind is that um, there should be some sort of cross-fertilization between these areas of specialization because the ecosystem is so complex and so interrelated and here we have a lot of specialties that focus on just one area or another and maybe we don't see those connections between um, the, uh, the different areas of specializ specialization and I, I'm wondering is there any effort uh, in our current uh, scientific community to bridge those gaps between the areas of specialization to try to get some synthesis of knowledge to address this complex problem we have with our environment. Y yes, there is. And um, I'll, give, I'll follow up on one of the examples actually that I talked about where I think it goes from uh, a compartment of a, of a community to the whole ecosystem and to try to understand how these kind of interactions uh, expand across the whole ecosystem. And actually, it concerns these forests right here, the lodgepole pine forests. And it turns out that after the Yellowstone fires, the best predictor of the number of seedlings after the fire in a given area was the frequency in the pre-forest, the pre-fire forest, of serotonous trees, trees that have the fire-adapted cones. So forests that had, let's say, 70% of the trees were serotonous there would be a couple hundred thousand, maybe 200, 300,000 seedlings per hectare. High density, you know, the dog hair thicket of growing into. Stands that had 30% uh, serotony had, I think, 50,000 seedlings. And the ones that had 2 or 3% serotony had 15 seedlings per hectare. So tremendous variation. And it turns out the number of seedlings per hectare then determines uh, the, the plant communities after, whether it's a, a dense forest or a meadowy, what influences the insect communities, influences the bird and mammal communities, influences the biogeochemistry of the streams and the soils. And guess what drives that variation in serotony from stand to stand? It's the selection by the squirrels. So you can have fire being uniform across Yellowstone, but there's geographic variation in the density of squirrels and the best predictor of the frequency of serotony are squirrels. And it's not squirrels selecting the habitat, actually they're selecting other features in the habitat than serotony. But because those presumably over the last 8,000 years since the forests have developed in Yellowstone after the last glacial, <laughs> the lodgepole pine forest, those squirrel densities are variable and they've been probably fairly consistent over that time period, leading to this fine structure of serotony across the landscape and then the whole ecosystem. So I think it's the thing is, I think what Jake is doing is Jake is focusing on these large mammals that often have big impacts and often you can scale up to ecosystems. It's finding the right organism and it seems like in the boreal forests or the conifer forests, um, especially in the west, that these red squirrels influence a lot. Actually the selection by the squirrels influences the density, the best predictor of the, the, the density of, red of uh, hairy woodpeckers in the lodgepole pine forest across the Rockies is basically the cone traits that are driven by the squirrels. So where squirrels exert strong selection, hairy woodpeckers are in low abundance. Where there's, when squirrels go, because hairy woodpeckers prefer the same traits that squirrels do, the cones evolve defenses against squirrels and by default or de facto are increasing defenses against hairy woodpeckers. Same thing for moths that eat the cones. Where you have squirrels, there's very few moths. You remove squirrels, there's more moths. And the whole breeding bird communities differ 
So where there's no squirrels, because they're nest predators, there's twice as many birds breeding there that breed in open cups or, near the, or up in the trees. So I think the key is to, at least my point of view, bias point of view, is that we're in the age of mammals, the last 60, 70 million years, and I think if on terrestrial systems, often mammals are the species that you'd want to focus on if you want to bridge the areas. If you want to study crossbills, it's, it's a lot, you're out of luck. They're interesting. Aesthetically, I think I, mean, I enjoy it. I'm passionate. It's, it's, it enriches my life, just like art enriches other you know, your lives. Um, and, and I also I like to know how things evolve and the processes that are important. Um, but I think they're basically ornaments on the tree. And they're fun to look at, but that's. But they. Uh, but I think mammals, in terms of, and certain termites, maybe ants, other people would argue, would be species that you could actually look at a component and expand. Institutionally, I think there's a lot more support for work that crosses disciplines. Funding agencies now have programs that are aimed at, for instance, funding. Um, uh, individuals who are working across disciplines to approach problems, even in, you know, not just you, you the, the disciplines you named were all biological, but across the social sciences and the humanities as well. You know, and an example at the University of Wyoming is our new Biodiversity Institute that brings together biologists, including the three of us, to look at issues together who come from very different disciplines in background. And then our Haub School of Environment and Natural Resources also includes social scientists, economists, um, agricultural economists, as well as um, you know, the fine arts. So there, there's an, there are many impetuses, impeti, for, uh, for interdisciplinary work, and there's institutional support to get it done. Anything else, other questions or comments? A big part of um, getting the public on board with conservation is um, uh, appealing to them not only with data, um, but I guess the, the grandeur of nature, the magnificence of some of these species. I mean, my gosh, look around you right now. Um, <clears throat> and so there, I think there's, there's interesting articulations between biology and humanities in that respect, the aesthetic of nature. Um, more specifically with respect to what I do, uh, so much of, uh, of what I do and what we do uh, in Kenya revolves around um, uh, creating and maintaining trust uh, with various stakeholders. And um, <clears throat> trust is one of those things that takes a long time to, uh, to create and it can disintegrate, but it can disintegrate pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> just like soil carbon. So. <laughs> It's something that we're always aware of, that we're always working toward, um, and uh, it, it's something that we really uh, strive for. And I think um, we do an okay job at it. We could always do a better job at it, um, but if we have uh, any successes uh, in, 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 my, in our research group, <clears throat> it will be due in large part to that synergy uh, with local communities. Any more that anybody would like to ask or comments you'd like to make for our speakers? Thank you. Lovely. Given, given that thank you has been said, let's say it with our hands and wonderful day. Thank you to all of you as well and to our panelists.